excited about the communities that you guys are building. I think uh, building the right infrastructures and the right communities to create um, essentially uh, a higher uh, a system to validate scientific research and to help you know gather feedback and all of this is, is definitely a centerpiece of the, the mission we've uh, set for ourselves. So um, yeah, so what are we building? So DSI Labs is building infrastructure to decentralized upgrade and fork our scientific record essentially, right? So the underlying idea is to use uh, the Web3 stack to essentially create autonomous repositories that have clear uh, traceability and transparencies of all the information that are on there. And uh, to, to have a user facing interface where scientists can publish their work, create uh, these research objects that we call these sign notes and essentially have you know custodianship and over ownership over them with a validation system that we call ARCs. This stands for Autonomous Research Communities, which is essentially a framework and a system and a DAO stack to uh, validate and verify scientific research. So I can uh, I can show you a couple of things I have for you guys. Uh, if I can manage my way through Google Meet, which is not my preferred <laughs> mode of communication for these talks. Uh, let's see, a window, not sure, a window. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, yeah. I'll, so. Okay, so is it, okay, so ignore, there we go. All right, so essentially, um, I'm sure mo many of you know, there are a lot of problems with the, the Scientific Record Act, uh, Act currently. Uh, as you, as you, you know, historically, it's been uh, custodian by libraries uh, across the world. Today, it's, it lives as a series of cloud databases that are owned by big scientific publishers, which have uh, extractive practices, like uh, most of you know, uh, it's pay to read and pay to write. There's paywalls. There's uh, extreme extraordinary fees for authors to publish their manuscripts. I always like to give the example of Nature Neuroscience, which I published in when I was doing my PhD, which essentially, you know, charges $11,800 for open access, you know, to authors. So that's a, uh, um, yeah, that's a ridiculous amount of money. And the profit margins of the big scientific publishers are the highest in the world of all big companies, right? So they are around 30 to 40%, which is higher than Apple. So essentially, it's a monopoly on knowledge that is extracting rent out of libraries and out of the scientific communities and out of funders. So there's deep unfairness in that system. And worst of all is that it really runs on an archaic backend, right? So the tech stack that supports the scientific record right now is essentially, hey, let's have a bunch of silos on AWS where we all gate, you know, who's allowed to see what research with our systems and our URLs and our paywalls. And uh, we're not going to make any sort of, you know, uh, upgrade to the system to like share code, data, artifacts, you know, uh, fair principles. Perhaps some of you have heard about that. No, no, no. We only have a business models for PDFs, right? And that's a big problem because there's essentially a, a, a disconnection between that science needs the stakeholders as scientists, as meta scientists who think what's best for science and the current situation, which is the only thing I can monetize as a publisher is I can sell PDFs and that's what I'm going to make money from. Right? It's also subjected to cross-national censorship. You know, three out of the big four scientific publishers have, uh, uh, you know, 1% or more of their work actually censored in China. Um, the, the system itself relies on the DOI. I don't know if any of you here are familiar with persistent identifiers and all the discussions around that, but essentially DOIs are administered are a persistent identifiers that link uh, digital objects, digital resources like a manuscript uh, to a metadata standard, which is served by Crossref and DataCite. And that's essentially the basic unit, the atomic unit of, uh, of knowledge, right? It's a PDF linked to a DOI that's uh, supported by metadata from Crossref and DataCite. Problem with this is that DOIs are essentially a lookup table. They break, they get crawled constantly. It's a social agreement, right? The social agreement is as follows. We're continuing our services and we trust that publishers with their silos will actually do the best things, you know, to maintain consistencies of these persistent identifiers and to ensure that content drift doesn't occur, right? And perhaps some of you don't know about content drift, but it's the problem of like web pages changing over time without having any sort of traceability for those changes, right? So essentially the DOI system is a social contract. 
And uh, we have now technologies that are far better that allow us to essentially generate uh, uh, cryptographically secure persistent identifiers. And most notably, uh, the backbone of GitHub is built using Merkle DAGs, which are you know, a way of generating these, these identifiers. And the whole system of IPFS uh, uses that, right? So IPFS, interplanetary file system, essentially is a component of the decentralized web. And every piece of data is essentially uh, uh, encrypted using a, a, a SHA-2 hash or another type of hashing system, which creates now a real persistent identifier. It's immutable, it's cryptographically secure, and it cannot break. The underlying payload is immune to quantum drift, right? So the question is, why don't we rebuild our scientific record using actually secure persistent identifiers, right? Having actual cross uh, resistance across national censorship well, the answer to that is that publishers have no interest to do this, of course. We don't want you know, a digital library to cure where everyone can have access to knowledge, where knowledge is essentially orchestrated to peer-to-peer -peer library. No, we want people to be redirected on our web page so we can get them to pay for the paywall, right? So we want to change that. And worst of all, I mean, it's extremely exploitative to scientists and to, and to, um, to, to people who give their free labor for creating the record, right? Um, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with this. So the ecosystem we're building at DSI Lab is essentially a number of components that interact to create fully decentralized repositories to store research objects, All right? So the idea is that we have gateways that are run by communities. These gateways are ways of front end where people can build and publish their work as research objects where they can es essentially link everything together and have the best user experience when it comes to, uh, to not having you know, to fill out these long forms and all the sort of things that scientists are expected to do, uh, um, because essentially we're, we're trading our time for prestige tokens, right? This is how it works, the publication ecosystem so that we can get more funding. So product designers, and there's no emphasis on UX, there's none of that, right? So we wanna change this. We, are, we wanna really be focused on the end users and I'll show you how this works. Um, essentially, the idea is that we have these gateways that write a manifest on IPFS, which is a research object, which is then indexed on Ethereum, right? So the idea is we index the root node of that, of that object on Ethereum, and we use, we gate things like authorship uh, and uh, um, uh, editing rights using non-transferable tokens, which you might have heard recently uh, called uh, soulbound tokens, right? So that's the essential idea. Uh, we wanna upgrade the unit of knowledge where it's a research object. That's really something that I think is long overdue and we need to essentially create connected permanent graphs of knowledge as our publication medium. And that's the whole concept behind the design infrastructure that we're building is that we wanna move away from the solitary manuscript towards research objects that are essentially permanent nautographs that allow for reproducible research. Um, and the idea is then, well, we need a curation mechanism. We all know that the value in science is curation. Preprint platforms are hugely popular now. You have things like BioArchive, the Archive that have really taken over communities. Problem is there's not, there's, there's not really a curation system that's embedded into that. And the matter is, uh, uh, the, the question is, right, how can we return the value that's done by scientific curation to scientists? So there's two angles to that. You know, some people will say, well, you know, there's actually no value to be returned because there's no value produced, right? And I think that's wrong, right? That's what the publishing industry would, you know, like to make you believe somehow that there's, there's and it's, it's fundamentally wrong, right? We need ways for scientists to be able to recapture the value they create. Um, so, we're, so yeah, for that reason, we're building these ARCs, autonomous research communities, which are essentially decentralized uh, uh, scientific societies that can operate on knowledge, that can essentially uh, produce scientific validation services. Um, we're also working, we also set up a foundation, the DSI Foundation, which is an organ which is there, you know, uh, to essentially uh, uh, give us advice on how to build this ecosystem because of course it's a tremendous undertaking and we want to be working you know close closely with meta scientists and people that have been thinking deep about the problems of reproducibility in science about the replication crisis about the broken incentives and the misalignment that the current system creates which is with because it over indexes on citation and impact factor and it under indexes on reproducibility and replicability, right? The question is how can we flip those incentives back so that we can recouple 
impact with replicability and reproducibility to create robust additive knowledge, right? So that's the role of the DSI Foundation in our ecosystem is to guide the parameterization of the ecosystem we're building. Uh, another thing we're, 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 we're building and, and something we're very excited about is the notion, hey, we can actually build peer-to-peer -peer library networks now, right? That run on IPFS, that run their own system. Why don't we create a place like a 3D virtual environment where we can actually showcase these beautiful uh, reproducible objects and actually, you know, put them, have them on pedestals and really create these digital museums of knowledge and science. And for this, we're uh, collaborating with a number of really talented artists to build what we call an open library of knowledge, which is essentially its own uh, metaverse library that anyone can be able to, to, to explore, walk through. This would, you know, allow us to, 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 to essentially have outreach and share the dream, share this vision of a better, more secure, more reproducible, uh, a more open scientific record. Um, so I've talked about this already, right? It's like, what should the, the, the Web3 unit of knowledge look like? Perhaps some of you have seen my, my video at EF Amsterdam, but essentially we need to transition away from this DOI linking PDF with data side and cross rep, and we need to move towards something where it says, hey, here's a container. That container, you could put any arbitrary byte sequences in there. You can add your data, you can add a code, you can add a slide deck, you can add a video, you can add anything. Right? And then you can link all of this together in a very simple user experience. And we want this to be an open creative space, experimental space that communities can actually appropriate for themselves. Right? They can define their own metadata specification to be conformant with the FAIR principles. They can essentially uh, uh, devise their own norms. So it's an open and creative space. And I think that's really important because you know, uh, Web3, I think a lot of it is about freedom and just breaking down borders that don't need to be here. And uh, we want to do the same with this redefinition of the research object. Um, I also mentioned this briefly. There's this idea of reproducible research. I'm sure you've heard about reproducible document stacks. Uh, this is the idea you have, you know, a PDF is just a front end for your work. But what actually really matters as a scientist is all the things that happen in the back end. Right, so it's like the data, the code, the computational pipeline, perhaps a video of your laboratory experiments. All of these things are extremely important as a scientist for me to be able to reproduce work of others. And we need to, in, if we ever want to be able to return independent replication at the summit of the pyramid of, sci of scientific validation, we need to make it easier for people to reproduce and to replicate other people's work and to dramatically reduce the cost of things. So I spent, you know, the first two years of my PhD reproducing a result in neuroscience. I can tell you, you know, it was very difficult and arduous and it needed need, it didn't need to be this way, right? So we need to essentially create a reproducible document stack, which is easy to use for people so that other scientists can replicate and reproduce each other's experiments. And this goes into the, the tradition also of research objects, right? Re the idea of a research object is, you know, we're gonna have a PID persistent identifier. We're gonna have all the components, you know, using the semantic web technologies, linking all of the components of a research form a knowledge graph. And this is essentially the unit of knowledge, the essential unit of knowledge. This has been proposed 10 years ago. It's never taken off. Um, and a lot of the reason, I don't know if you, some of you are uh, familiar with uh, uh, semantic web and, and these type of discussion, and, uh, w3 standards but uh, you know Aaron Schwartz uh, wrote about this in one of his unpublished in his unpublished book and he said you know a lot of this resembles more Talmudic debates than actual you know things that are in the interest of practitioners and you know developers and, and, and end users right so uh, this, there's a there's a kind of a disconnect there nonetheless the idea is is, is a it's an excellent idea and it needs to have a fair chance of being implemented and that's what we're really going to go for I can give you a demonstration here of what it looks Looks. Um, just give me a second. Let's see. Oh, Google Meet. Uh, okay. So this is the landing page of Protocol Lab Research. So. Where do I want to go here as a scientist? Um, you want to go to download PDF, right? That's what you're looking for. You don't want to stay any longer that you need on a publisher's website at all. And I think, you know, one of the number one thing when I go on a website of publishers, like, okay, 
give me the text. I want to be able to read it. And so, um, so that's where we want to be. So here you have your typical uh, uh, PDF viewer. That's where people read scientific research uh, and vast majority of the time. The difference here is that there is an embedding on top, right? There's a, there's essentially, I don't know if some of you are, are familiar with Crossmark. Crossmark is a way to check for updates. It's essentially a URI that's embedded into a PDF. And here we're doing the same thing, right? So people that create these DSI notes, these research objects, essentially at the end of the process, there is a link to the immutable token ID that's on chain, which is essentially connecting the PDF with the underlying knowledge graph that the scientist has produced to share his research, right? So here we are. This is the what we call kind of layer zero for knowledge. It's essentially a front end where people can build uh, and publish and share these research objects. We have here an icon which uh, allows you to navigate all of the components of that piece of research, right? I'm not gonna go into detail about what this is about, but it's very important. It's about ZK SNARKs and it's about how you scale them. And essentially you now have all the components. You have a history where you have the different versions of that piece of knowledge that have been committed on chain on Ethereum using optimism. So we got the cost down to approximately $2. Uh, you have source which essentially has contributors, metadata, and different items here. Uh, interestingly, we gate the uh, versioning of this uh, token on, on, on Ethereum using non-transferable tokens or soul-bound tokens, which are essentially bound to the author's wallet, right? So you have up here Web3 wallet, and this is essentially what's gating the uh, uh, versioning rights of that object. Um, you have the history, everything is transparent, all of the, all of the, the, essentially it's like a GitHub for scientists, right? So now that we have the ability, because I, the underlying data model here is IPLD, I don't know if some of you are familiar with IPLD, but it's essentially a form of JSON that contains CIDs, CIDs being these persistent identifiers that do not break, that are cryptographically secure, and this type of data model suits itself extremely well to uh, uh, versioning and version control and all of these things, and it's actually the, the, the base of GitHub, right? Git is essentially a, a system that's based on that logic of a Merkle tree, right? So here we're indexing Merkle trees, we're taking the root of that Merkle tree, indexing them on chain. Every time a new version is published, there's an event log and we can keep the immutable trace of all of this and anyone can run such a gateway as what I'm showing you right here, right? And query uh, the knowledge of that uh, digital library on uh, directly using a DAP. Um, now we have the components, and in these components, I can do different things. For example, I can have my research report, I can have result presentation deck, I can add a video, I can add essentially you know, all sorts of arbitrary information into that bucket, and then I can start to weave it together and to tie it together. And incidentally, because I'm tying everything together, I'm generating extremely precious machine uh, readable metadata, and I'm gonna go over this in a second. So for example, we have here the ability to add annotations, so you can, you can communicate with the public, you can go direct, you, you can you know, perhaps like lower your level of jargon and say, hey, if you're interested here in learning what are trusted ceremonies and why they matter, read this, right? Here's some links, here's some interesting information about it. And you can essentially continue to navigate through this. Uh, you have you know, support for equations. And the feature that we're very excited about is that actually the ability to embed executable code directly into these manuscripts that are, that are essentially allow people to reproduce these, the, the core results of these studies in a user-friendly way. So here, for instance, I can go directly into my, my, my the, the, I'm directly into this interface. I can say, hey, okay, I wanna regenerate this figure. Now, my PDF viewer turns into an IDE. So I have an IDE, I can run compute. I can essentially start reproducing the results. I can perhaps you know, even edit, vary the parameters, test different things. And all of this happens in that unified experience, which is essentially born out of the place that scientists want to be, which is in their PDF viewer, right? That's where we like to be. So you can start reproducing the results. You can easily you know, come in and out. You have the ability to navigate uh, this reproducible document stack while well, maintaining the ability to share it as we've always shared those, right? You can keep sharing your work, you can write an email, drop in the PDF, you can like send the link. You don't need to change the way that we as scientists actually practice science and practice scientific publishing because everything is tied together with this persistent identifier, which is linked to this immutable token ID that is stored on chain, which contains all the versions. And that allows me to essentially share my work like I always do. So it's fully interoperable. I can put it back on the archive 
I can put it on BioArchive. As long as the, PI, the, the PID, the embedding remains, everyone can go into DSI, you know, query our, our, our local IPFS node, get the data back, download it, start playing with it, you know, interact with it on that gateway. So um, yeah, so that's that's something we're we're uh, really looking forward to. Uh, another part is there's a lot of uh, organizations that have tried to go beyond impact factor, right? So uh, going in beyond impact factor and having uh, markers of scientific quality has is really at the forefront now of a lot of funders, of a lot of scientific societies. So you have organizations like the Open Science Foundation that have made badges, right? Have you shared your data? Well, here's a badge proving that you shared your data. Have you shared your code? Well, here's a badge, right? So the idea here has been uh, has, has percolated through the scientific sphere. There's organization like the ACM, the uh, 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 American Computer, uh, the Association for Computing Machinery. They've issued badges such as you know, has your work, uh, have you published artifacts alongside your work, or is it just a solitary PDF? Well, here's one, right? Uh, they've published, uh, they have badges like, you know, are your artifacts functional? Does your code actually run? You know, is it well documented? Uh, can you actually, can we actually re reproduce your results? You know, have your results been replicated? All of this is essentially a way to have different markers of scientific quality and knowledge robustness. Uh, that we don't have today with the singular metric of citations and impact factor, right? And so that's that's a that the idea here is can we create an interface, a system where all of the information necessary to verify these markers of qualities are within the same interface space, such that we reduce the cost and the 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 the, the effort that it takes to verify whether or not these attributes. Uh, of that research are warranted given what the authors have supplied, right? And here comes the ARCs, right? These autonomous research communities. And the idea here is that we can start offering a range of scientific validation service over these research objects, right? We can verify attributes, we can provide peer review reports, we can start doing all of these things. And one of the core uh, features of these DSI nodes is that we can because we're publishing those on chain, we can actually now bundle funding channels with actual research. And that's, a, that's something we could not do before. So I could come here and I could say this, well, this, this research is, is really interesting for me. I would like to see it replicated before I undertake you know, an expensive project to, um, to essentially implement it, right? So I could go on a validation tab and I can say, hey, uh, I would like to verify it. And now anyone can essentially say, hey, you know, I would like to add a replication grant to this piece of work. And I would like the ARC specialized in cryptology to administer it. And you can add a replication grant, and this is all uh, done on chain. So I'm minting a validation grant that now becomes part of that research object as being added to essentially to that data structure. And now we have one Ethereum as a validation grant that you know, the ARC could decide to pick up or not in order to generate you know, revenue for itself and to create uh, fellowships and, and, and systems to promote, uh, uh, to help their members essentially and to return the value that uh, is, is created by curating and verifying knowledge. Right. So that's the idea behind these, 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 this open verifiability, right? And I think it's quite a profound concept because when you think about it, there's no real reason why only scientists should have the right to interact causally with knowledge, right? Now, anyone in the world with a Web3 wallet in a single click can actually say, hey, does this COVID study, is this actually reliable? Can I trust that, right? And people can have, you know, the, the ability to causally influence the graph of knowledge, which is something that we don't have right now. It's gated by institutions. It's gated by scientific research groups. You could say it's gated by, you know, Twitter fights, but we should have less Twitter fights and we should have more, uh, um, essentially, a better epistemic commons at a higher level of, of uh, intellectual discussion that we can orchestrate and integrate in the framework that we're presenting here. So, so yeah, so that's the, that's the, the, the core idea, the core uh, system behind DSI nodes, which uh, we consider to be kind of the base layer on top of which other things will be built, right? And I wanna talk to you a little bit more about these other things. This is very early by the way. Chris, we, did we lose Chris there? He accidentally knocked himself up line. I was actually going to jump in and ask a I couple hope questions just that were coming up. Blew my mind a thousand times. Yeah, there we go. You're muted though, Chris. You're back. We can see you, but we can't. There we go. 
Okay, this is me with Google Meets, guys. Sorry. <laughs> no worries, no worries. That's actually convenient because I did want to stop. I saw there were at least a few questions in chat, and I saw that Philip was jumping in and answering uh, some of them in chat. But I just want to make sure that we uh, we touch on uh, the the ones that have been brought up so far. Um, so I will just start. Oh, Rich just dropped a couple in there. Uh, I, I, I was going to pick Stephanie's question. So I'll, I'll quickly ask Stephanie's and then we'll jump to, to Rich's list. Um, but the last question Stephanie had asked was, why reinforce the traditional idea of publication as the most important unit? So I think because it's not, it should be the research object, right? This is, this is the most important unit of science. It's essentially your publication is a summary of what you've achieved from a dense array of data, methods, all sorts of things, right? And this, it's essentially a distillation of all that approach that has led to you creating new knowledge, right? And, and you, you, what we wanna do is de-emphasize the actual manuscript and emphasize the underlying research objects, right? So that's, that's the approach here. So does that mean you can submit a research object without a manuscript? Yeah, you that's can. That's my question. You okay. can, you can definitely. Uh, I mean, it's going to be a bit unwieldy to 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 interact with, but you definitely can, right? It's no problem. It would probably help if you have a descriptor in there, right? So that tells people what you've actually uploaded in your in your uh, research object. But yeah, in principle, yes. yeah. So so this is why we have you know a plug and play data system for metadata for uh, for essentially so that you can verify your data. I don't know if you are like familiar with the fair principles and all of this, but it's essentially the idea that you want it to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, right? It's a, it's a huge topic at the, at the, for funders and for, for different institutions right now. And uh, that means, you know, and, and there's no current technological stack that actually supports the, 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 the ideals behind the fair principles, right? And so we want to be able to build a technological stack that actually goes above and beyond and really allows to support that, right? And a big part of that is fair metadata as well. You know, I'll just quickly mention, because I realized we uh, we kind of just got excited and got right into into presenting on things and didn't even do kind of intros or anything. You know, in case people are wondering uh, why kind of Chris or Philip are working on this, um, you know, Chris comes from, uh, he completed a PhD in neuroscience, and uh, I'll obviously let both of you kind of fill in the more detailed elements, but Chris was kind of working in neuroscience as a scientist and had gone through that before jumping into, into Web3 and technology. And Philip, uh, up until, oh, well, I guess you still technically are a, a formal academic in, in uh, the French University in the, in the Netherlands, but uh, was working at a, an American university before that and just has a general background as an economics professor. Uh, and so, yeah, they're, they're both very familiar with various aspects of the uh, wonderful challenges when it comes to uh, academic knowledge sharing. I don't know if there's anything else y'all wanted to, to add in around your own personal backgrounds before I run through some of Rich's questions. Um, um, thank you for the introduction, Eugene. I'm happy to like spend the time and like go through some questions. Well, cool, yeah. So the first one that Rich had asked um, was, is the value you are creating for scientists reputational or financial? Yeah. So I think, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so there's two things, right? Uh, the most, the, the thing we want to do perhaps above all else is, um, uh, break the rent-seeking monopoly of big scientific publishers, and especially the way, the way they treat scientists as free laborers, that they then go on to like sell our work, right? So this is fundamentally unfair. And the idea here is how do we recapture that value? Well, is it by charging authors and then, you know, more and like allowing some of that value to go to people that do scientific validation? I don't think that's the answer to that. I think the answer to that has to do with just opening the gates of verifiability, right? And I think that that's, that's perhaps the most uh, uh, mind-bending fact about the, the system we're, we're building and the most experimental as well. So, and as when it comes to reputation, so that's the other part of the question. Absolutely. The problem right now is there's no way for scientists to get a reputation for going above the call of duty of publishing a manuscript, right? I published my code, I published my, I put all of those, you know, nobody gave the damn about it, right? Editors didn't really matter. Uh, the, the thing is we need ways to give credit to people to go, who go along above and beyond the call of duty, right? And who create reproducible research. And the way, the only way we can do that is we need a framework to verify research objects, right? 
And to verify research objects, we need to have, a, a, we need more than a framework, we need a tech stack that supports an interface, a UI, that allows people to easily verify these research objects and to grant badges to each other, right? To grant prestigious attributes, right? So it's not just about how much your work has been cited. It should be about, has your work been replicated? Is it reproducible? You know, is there a knowledge graph? Have you created a knowledge graph that allows others to recompose your discovery and your claims from the ground up? And that's what we should be rewarding in terms of prestige. That's something that we've, or at least uh, me from my sort of neophyte perspective of the this, this whole world, I come from the industry. And so um, one of the first uh, things that I've struggled with was uh, talking to researchers and then saying, okay, well, you've been published, what are you going to do now? And then being sort of met with, well, what do you mean? Uh, because that that was the goal. And now you're on to something else. And I'm wondering, well, well, it feels like there's 15 or 20 steps missing. Like what happens after this? Like who's using it? How are we verifying it? How are we commenting on it? How are we getting it to people that are going to use this stuff? There's, it sounds like you're anticipating a lot of these questions. Um, I, I, Actually, and put your feet to the fire here because it feels like maybe you're dodging my first question here. So, there's a, a tremendous amount of money. You mentioned like a fan, like astronomical amounts of cash are going into these publishers. Um, if that uh, that gatekeeping is disrupted, um, yeah, are you saying, well, that that was gatekeeping as pointless? Um, that money didn't need to be collected and or distributed. So this is now free and open or more egalitarian. Or are you saying that like, hey? Uh, let's redirect those funds back closer to the source, the people that need it, back into the pockets of scientists? Or is, is this stuff that hasn't been quite planned out yet? Or is there clear plans to take some of that revenue so, and put it back into the people that generated the, the data? Yeah, so, so I think there's room for both things, right? There's both for like reducing the total sums extracted and then from the total sums extracted, returning value mm -hmm. to scientists that actually contribute to verifying. Uh, knowledge because that's actually very time consuming, right? It takes about six hours to do a peer review report. All of this is pro bono labor. Uh, the peer review suffers from different numbers of failure mode, you know, for people lacking motivations and otherwise, right? Like gatekeeping, lack of effort, lack of competence, all of these things, right? So ideally, I mean, I put a high premium on having reliable information and I think we all should, right? Especially in, in the sea of unreliable information that we're currently swimming in, we need to have ways to curate essentially, you know, oracles that tell you something here is, is you know, worthy it's actually rigorous it's been well done i think there's tremendous value in scientific curation right and there's also no reason why work should go unrecognized right especially in the context of um the, the current you know stagnating wages of academics the difficulties of like having a family when you're postdoc all of these things are like morally unsustainable from my point of view right so no reason why scientists that actually contribute to cleansing our information sphere right reducing our information hazard shouldn't be able to capture value there and i think that's have, uh, I mean, no yeah. i think you know, i'm a thousand percent aligned with that way of thinking um is this plans for the future do you have mechanisms in the, in or designed or in mind that would actually make that happen yeah so i can i can show you uh something here this is very early uh let's see uh, and i guess the side question is are you going to look at this from a tokenomics problem or are you going to look at this just from a more of a, a finance problem um yeah let I'll, I'll first go on this and then i'll answer the second part of it so yeah so these arx autonomous research communities the idea is that we can essentially build DAO stacks for scientists to perform uh scientific validation services that they can completely own that are completely sovereign to them to their scientific societies um membership in these arcs are essentially soul bound tokens or non-transferable tokens, right? There's identity verification, that's part of it. And uh, these ARCs can issue fellowships, right? So the idea as a scientist personally, and this might not be the case for every scientific society, I just put this out there. It's just one type of archetype. Essentially, you know, the, the scientific society collects these, these bounties, right? It starts validating knowledge, it starts improving and creating knowledge, and it's collecting this, this source of revenue. And then what it can do is actually say, hey, we're going to take that revenue and split it up into fellowships, micro fellowship, perhaps, you know, 300 to 500 euros a month uh, die in that case. And you know what? 300 to 500 euros makes a, can make a tremendous difference in the life of an early career researcher, right? So we have the marginal cost for us here of doing that. It's very low compared to the amount of goods it can create, especially since some scientists, you know, might say, hey, 
you know what? I have a pro-social motivation in doing peer review. I'm not here for the money. I don't want to be paid for a service. But you know what? If by doing peer review and by contributing to, to verifying the scientific record, I actually create opportunity for early career researchers that are being financially exploited by the institutional system, you know what? I'll do it because that's worth it, right? So that's the idea underlying uh, 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 the, the way we're thinking about these autonomous research communities, right? It's, it's less of a paper service mechanism and more of a here's an option for you to do real good in your community. If you're, you know, one of uh, great researchers who, who essentially you're consulting, your hourly rate for consulting is like extremely high and you would definitely feel insulted, you know, having, you know, facing like a hundred dollar payoff or something like that, right? But the ability to essentially redistribute that value to people you care for, for perhaps, you know, postdoc in your team, that doesn't have, you don't have these institutional leverage to improve the salaries or improve the financial conditions of the people you work with. Well, here's one, right? Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's the idea behind that. Uh, so it'd be up the to the ARCs to manage treasuries and see exactly and exactly okay. so we're just going to provide a number of like clear starting points with different archetypes and we'll just let the arcs uh uh this you know self-govern and decide for themselves how they want to do that right i think we're really fond of we emphasize the idea of like sovereignty and uh ownership so it's very important for us and richard maybe uh just to add to your question so an important aspect of this is also who is currently paying for the subscription fees to these journals. And it's ultimately, uh, uh, it's either universities or their owners. So in, in European countries, it's usually the governments that negotiate on behalf of the universities uh, with these publishers. And, you know, once we, once we reach a point where, you know, their, their bargaining power to extract those rents from, from the public and from universities and tuition payers and taxpayers, it's been shrinking then the question becomes so what what do these payers decide to do with their money instead right so are they going to uh, to to use it to cut ca taxes or lower tuitions or are they actually going to put it into research so that's partly ob obviously out of our out of our hands but this is this is really what's going to be going on at the end right? so a viable second option for existing grants mechanisms Sounds good. That's very interesting. Thank you for the time. Uh, Eugene, you don't have to monopolize my next five questions. We can bounce around. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I'm going to interrupt that flow with because I see Bianca and right. Stephanie have added some as well. So we, we will pepper and come back to uh, and default Sounds back good. to yours when we work through the others. But one that Bianca asked was, could you clarify how would you be able to orchestrate comments from non-scientific experts on scientific objects once their amounts scale up? Uh, so thinking of social media like interactions and the potential of fake news. Yeah. So, so okay. So the first thing. So I showed you in this demo for these sign notes. You have these annotations. These are not open to the public, right? You don't want just anyone to come in and start doing graffitis on your work, obviously, right? So these. This is a, a, a gated system to the authors. However, uh, the way we're thinking about it is that anyone can fork a scientific discovery, and essentially, this is what arcs do. They go on a on a on a piece of knowledge. They fork it and then they propose a merge to the original authors after having added the validation services to it right so that's how we think about it in principle there's also the possible the possibility for other people to fork the work and start you know doing perhaps you know post-publication peer review on it right on a spontaneous basis so that's possible but we should never start mixing the original research object that should be on the total control of its authors with you know the commentary layer right so it's important that we separate you know the social comments from the bits research in a way that creates, you know, uh, stacks that are clearly cleanly separated and delineated here. Yes, I don't know, Bianca, if there were any other follow-ups, cool. So thank you. So I'm assuming not right now. Obviously, feel free to hop on uh, audio or mention in the chat if there is anything else you want to clarify there. Uh, Stephanie also asked, you mentioned UX a few times. How are you structuring the UX research for this process and which methods are you using? How do we structure the UX research? Did I understand that correctly? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, how are we structuring yeah, so the I'm, UX? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll clarify a little bit. I'm curious if you've done user interviews with some of the scientists to develop, um, I would call them personas, but I think you might be calling them archetypes. Um, I'm curious if you've been doing usability testing where you've been having people work through on screen, either moderated or unmoderated the product, having them do tasks, seeing what so works, what doesn't. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a great question. So we have two approaches to this. So what you've seen here is a demo. The editor is not yet functional. We're building it and we're going to be releasing the first version of these sign outs on the uh, 7th of June. Uh, we have set up a Discord product community where we have a feedback system, ticket system, and a group of early users and adopters who will start. We're going to be rolling out progressive features up to September before the official release of the, uh, of the, of the platform. Right, so that's number one. The number two, when it comes to UI and UX, so we have, we're, we're fortunate to have many, many great scientists in our foundation and ESI foundation. I think there is a, uh, the mission has a tremendous echo in the academic sphere and people are more than happy to, you know, we've had, we've been having these structured interviews with other scientists, you know, and just showing them the product, how it works, how it feels to get, you know, spontaneous reaction and to essentially improve, you know, uh, um, uh, and clarify some of the pain points that they experience in the current system. So these two approaches. And, you know, if you're thinking of A-B testing and these kinds of things, no, no, it's way too early. You know, we have, we, we, we have to like first start with a, you know, a, a, a essentially, you know, take a lot of uh, uh, instinct, gut feeling and feedback from close peers, extend to Discord community and just take it from there. And I guess and again, that, I mean, it, it's a, it's a really great point because I think UX is everything personally. So I, that that's like if I if I had to put the emphasis on one point, I would say usability. And the person that matters is the end user, meaning the scientist uploading his work. Right, that is the person that matters for me because I want to be able to use the system, make a DCI nodes in like thirty minutes max, and just push it. Right. I want to be able to link my GitHub repository, my data, put a YouTube video of my work. You know, maybe a slide deck, uh, different things. I want to link it to my manuscript and I just want to push it and I want to be done with it. I shouldn't be struggling for half a day with these publisher interfaces just to push like a PDF. That's ridiculous. Yeah, and Stephanie, obviously not to put you on the spot, but if you are comfortable responding or giving any thoughts to that, I would definitely be very uh, interested in, in hearing, uh, yeah, just, you know, candid response to, to that. And if you think that is well thought enough uh, or out, or if you think there are clear blind spots or anything along those lines. Uh, and just for, for your uh, knowledge and for everyone else's knowledge, Stephanie just has some very relevant experience in the UX design and uh, sort of facilitating knowledge exchange and interaction there. Yeah, I might systematize your interviews a bit and maybe have some user interviews with the scientists in your structured communities where you're asking the same questions so that you can draw those like three main generalizable points or like, get the feedback from your community in a in a systematized way because the way i look at it that's also a research object eventually for you is Great. the process behind building the product so let's I build it together <laughs> i think our uh, community manager eric who is on this call here uh, he's gonna love what you just said so he uh, he basically proposed a, a system uh, like that for our beta test so uh, We'll do a lot of that and uh, and get a lot of structured feedback from from our beta testers. Well, that makes me really happy to hear. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll I'll jump to uh, back to Rich's list, uh, and if I missed anyone else's questions, please feel free to nudge them back up or just hop on audio. But this one's specific around IPFS and some of the technical uh, limitations in regards to pinning lookup times, eventual rep payments, et cetera. Is this a workable long-term solution? So let me just go through the questions. Um, okay. Yeah. So this was number two. So, OK, yeah. so IPFS and Filecoins are two different things, I think. Uh, so IPFS doesn't have rent payment, per se, right? So IPFS is a fully uh, voluntary network where people can pin the files oh. that they want and run a local node, right? Okay. Currently, currently, right? Um, and the the so there, I think we can have uh, we we should have like a structured rollout here. So the ideal is a system where you have a fully autonomous repository of knowledge. Meaning, when you mint one of these nodes, there's a premium over the mint cost, which goes to a treasury, which serves to secure the underlying asset for the long term. Right, serves to secure the underlying payloads. That means you don't need to think about it. Right. And most importantly, there's no business continuity risk, right? If the company goes bankrupt, if someone stops using it or things like that starts happening, there's not just the S2 Amazon cloud that goes down and it's over, right? You essentially well, have I... an, yep. Well, that, but if, so somebody has to be, um, 
it, I guess my, one of my contentions here is that free rent on data isn't going to last forever in this space. And so at some point, somebody's going to have to be paying, whether it's Arweave or Filecoin or IPFS or whoever's next. Um, some, so you're saying that the treasuries would be managing that and it's not at risk of like a technology stack collapsing, but is that responsibility handed to the ARCs or is it handed to some meta organization or so, who would be in charge of maintaining data consistency? Yeah, yeah. so there, I think there's the ideal here and there's the where we have to start at. Where we have to start at is essentially having a treasury that's managed by the DeSci Foundation. And essentially that treasury would be there to uh, secure the long-term data storage. Uh, in the future, however, once you know the FDM, Falcon Virtual Machine, or other innovation starts really kicking in, we will have the possibilities to create, you know, what we call autonomous repositories of knowledge, where there's a cost that you pay on Mint, and that cost is actually goes there to like secure that data for the long term, such that you have a front end where you can see, oh, there's X copies of this actual uh, piece of data. The leases are valid until X, right, until Y, and you have now a fully user-facing, right, securities around the storage properties of the underlying payload of the Merkle DAC, right? So that's the ideal, but we're not there yet. We're missing a couple of components, a couple of steps in this decentralized stack to actually get there, but that's the vision. And yes, people will have to pay for it. I mean, uh, data storage is not free. I guess the good news is that that IPFS uh, is um, is actually a lot cheaper than uh, than other storage solutions. So it's um, mm. uh, that definitely helps us to uh, to make this system sustainable in the long term. Yeah, I think we can we can definitely have you know have a, yeah have a fraction of the cost of Amazon S two, for instance. Are you guys anticipating uh, storing data sets as well, or is it just the model? Yeah, yeah, uh, public data sets. So right now we don't have any access control or, or mechanism for restrained data. And to be honest, I don't want to have any of that on IPFS. So uh, that, so in that case, people will post as part of the research object, a data accessibility notice, which has the conditions, the address of the repository for the restricted access, you know, and also uh, information about who's allowed to access it, right? We, this is only for publicly open data. I don't think blockchain and permissionless systems uh, work very well with restricting data access because they are slippery so we don't want uh we, we definitely don't want that at least in the short run and there was a umar came in with a, a question generally related to research objects and storage though in a slightly different direction but what research objects will be stored through your platform will they be ones that are already open access I mean, it can be anyone, really. Uh, so the question, I mean, if you're thinking whether or not we're going to just scrape all the open access stuff and put it there, we're not going to do that. I think uh, so. there's additional restrictions like legally on this. Um, but essentially, any scientist should be able to put their work in open access right on this platform. And the thing that comes with it, right, is that it's actually proof of open access. Right, The moment the Merkle bag is indexed on chain, the moment the, the, that knowledge graph has been created and it's stored on IPFS, you actually have proof of open access because there's no one in the world that can put a paywall on it, right? It's not on a private cloud. It's, it's just, it's a fully decentralized, uh, um, essentially archival system right, in the back. That's the, that's the ideal. Uh, that sounds awesome. Uh, the reason for this question was more just like a concern around like copyright. Like I know like some journals will say, you know, uh, if, if your paper has been published with us, it's under copyright, uh, it can't be shared openly. Uh, so I guess I'm, okay. uh, the question's more like, what, what about like those papers? So that, that's a psyops by journals because there's, there's a thing called the author accepted manuscript, which belongs to the author, not to the journal, right? So any scientist that publishes his work with a journal and the moment the editor says, yes, we'll take your work. Uh, and by the way, now we formatted it, added our branding and here's the proof. Can you check it? Well, you're not allowed to put the proof on here, but you're definitely allowed to put the author accepted manuscript, right? And that's green OA. So that's a that's a that's been a legal fight. That's been a legal legal battle, and I guess there's not enough awareness of it. But essentially, anyone can put their work on there because the copy the journal cannot take your copyright away for your author's uh, uh, accepted version, right? Yeah, maybe to add to that, so a lot of journals, uh, I think actually the vast majority of them, they uh, uh, they actually encourage or at least tolerate that their authors put their work on preprint platforms. 
And uh, just like Chris said, so the restriction is usually you're not allowed to put the, the final accepted and formatted version that the journal actually printed on these preprint platforms. But you can put on these platforms basically the identical content uh, that hasn't been formatted by, uh, by the journal yet. In some cases, they may say, well, you're only allowed to post the one uh, the version that you submitted to us, not the one that resulted from the peer review process. So this is something that you know every journal and, and every author would, would have to check. But in general, authors do have the legal right to make their, their work publicly accessible to platforms like that. Uh, that's awesome. I have one more question, kind of unrelated, but just while I'm on the mic. Um, and that's, uh, I was super excited to hear about the forking aspect of like letting people fork research objects. I was wondering, uh, how does that work? Like who, who can fork a research object? Is it anyone? And also, um, if someone does choose to fork a research object, um, uh, is there any sort of like check? Like does the author then uh, get the ability to merge it back to their paper? And I guess again, like just like how would that work? Is it very similar so to GitHub? Yeah, so so now we're very far out in the in the in the realm of things we haven't yet fully decided on, right? There's essentially two approaches. You can say only orgs can fork, right? And then you have a permission system. You could say anyone can fork, but by the way, if it's an arc that's forking the research object, you'll know about it. Right. So these are kind of two. I, I'm more much more on the second part of this approach, right? I would like, you know, these research objects to be forkable, but I don't know yet the psychological, you know, consequences and effect that this can have, right? It's essentially a way of doing post-publication peer review. Um, I think it's super powerful. I think if we had, you know, GitHub has not taken up with scientists now because it's actually optimized for software, right? And that's the truth. That's the end of it, right? Trying to like package GitHub and say, hey, everyone should make their papers on GitHub. It's never going to work. That wasn't the original intent of GitHub. But the underlying technology of GitHub, the idea of having Merkle trees that can actually be forked, merged, and, and you know, move in this open form is a beautiful idea that should be applied to science, right? But we need the right interface. We need the right UI for this. And it's not GitHub, right? That's what we know. I don't know what it is. I'm hoping that we're going to get closer to it with what we're building here. Thank you. Cool. So I saw there was a question that... I love your questions, in. by the way. Yeah, and I wanted to, to jump in and follow up on Bianca's. I still have some concerns relating to the forking. It's true that users will know that the fork research object is not the original validated one, but this may not stop people from endorsing pseudoscience coming from the fork nodes. Uh, why, why not gatekeeping the forking as well to only verified researchers? It's a philosophical question, and I think that there's pros and cons to both. And I think it's a hard choice. And I'm, you know, I'm more than happy to like talk to you and other people to like decide on what's the wisest path here. Because I can well, see pros a, and cons. From a nerd's perspective, I can talk about what happens in the world of dev and code. Is that uh, these forks, you would just walk back up the tree until you find out what the delta is and who changed what at what point and who the original owner was. So it's the auditing and the audit trail and the uh, openness of the actual forking process that works so well in at least GitHub. So presumably the same thing with working with data sets. Or am I missing something? Yeah, yeah. So that that's the same case. So you you there's definitely the that you can definitely go up the trail of the Merkle tree and see the original, right? So there's there's not going to be confusion about a research object being the actual true research object from the researcher, given that it's been forked. But there could be you know some more, uh, so some more subtle psychological forces at play here that we have to mm -hmm. be mindful about. At least the opportunity for investigation exists. You can just dig in to find out where the changes occur. Yeah, interesting. And so another idea we had on that topic, but again, it's not really finished. And I think this is also potentially controversial. So something that needs to be, uh, that we need to tread carefully with is the idea of like, hey, I fork a research object. I make it better. I've improved it. I gave you feedback. I've improved the artifacts. I really made it better. I made it more fair, improved the metadata. It's actually better, right? You know, I can send now a merge proposal back to the original authors, right? But what should happen to the cap table of the of the research object, right? I, I strongly feel that someone who has taken an existing research object has made it better should now be a contributor of that object, right? So if the original authors accept the merge, the, the person who has forked the object and has improved it should be part of the cap table of that discovery, right? Of the credit table. We wouldn't call that person an author because this is a very kind of psychologically guarded term, 
but we can still call him a contributor and make him part of that discovery. And I think that would be an intrinsic motivation for people to build open source research objects. But yeah, again, it feels like there'd be a significant reputational advantage if somebody was like, well, I've fixed five other papers and here's my badges to prove it. That'd be really cool. Huge, huge, right? And now you can take you know, a great paper and actually make it better and surprise the authors with your feedback and your ideas. And they're like, oh, hell yeah, we're all going to merge it, right? And oh, yeah, you're going to be part of the contributors and you're acknowledged. You're acknowledged. There's mm -hmm. no way to do this in science right now. Can't hear you, Eugene. Sorry. Uh, do you have a mechanism for ensuring that fundamental and long-range research receives attention and funding? I worry that without the curation of an edited journal, you disincentivize blue sky research. Or to add my own uh, element to the question, how do we avoid funding mapping a social network graph effectively of just like whoever are the, the most popular scientists or who already are publishing in Nature and New York Times, how do we avoid them getting all the money and it actually going to the quality? Wow, that's a question. Um, I mean, I, there's, there's different aspects to this. I mean, to be fair, um, you know, we don't, we don't purpose to, uh, we're, we're not claiming we're going to fix everything, right? I think the, the fact that, you know, creating an anonymous system so people don't know who are the authors would be kind of like the solution here, but it doesn't work for a variety of sociological factors, right? Uh, this is a mechanism that's typically used for uh, acceptance in conferences, right? In computer science conferences, for example, right? So um, I don't have an answer to that. I think, um, you know, another, other things we're investigating with the DSI Foundation are impact certificates and specifically measuring, you know, the causal impact of a, of a given, you know, part of the scientific graph uh, on the uh, unlocking of a core, you know, disruptive technology and having systems so credit can percolate down of that, right? So presumably if you have a good system, then we're gonna, we're gonna bypass the, hey, it's a famous author, it makes all the buzz, right? But you know what, there's also perhaps reasons why famous authors do make all the buzz because we do have heuristics and the heuristic is this person has done good things in the past, he's more likely to do good things in the future. There's also a component of this, right? The bad feedback loop is like, oh, his name is good, therefore it's good, right? I think that's a real problem, especially when it comes to uh, um, uh, the, these like self-fulfilling prophecies of impact factor, right? Oh, because you published in Nature Neuroscience, actually now you're gonna get more pub citations that if you publish the same work in another journal, right? So those are those are a bit tricky. At the end, it's all the it's there's a matter of the scholarly attention economy, right? And that's a that's a complex space. Um, I don't have a good answer for you on this. I would love to like think about it more. Um, I agree. We need better mechanisms to uh, uh, essentially select and curate and put you know great research at the forefront that isn't necessarily made by you know big name authors that tend to already have accrued all the credit in the space, right? Yeah, and I think it's, oh, Philip, you're muted if you wanted to, to quickly add something else to that one. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to add that you're actually raising a very fundamental question, which is how should we distribute available research funds most effectively, right? So what's the right way of doing that? And I think the sad truth is that we don't know. I think scientists don't know, policy makers don't know. We're just literally like walking in the dark. And the situation is so bad that, you know, the, the funding mechanisms that exist, they often make it almost impossible to really evaluate the, the causal impact that a particular funding mechanism has had. So there's some trick around that, but, but ultimately we know very, very little about the impact of the funding itself. Neither, and we know almost nothing about what's the optimal mechanism. So. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that uh, that is a, in its own right an encouraging note to end on because we have so many questions to explore together as a community and to try to kind of come up with ways to experiment around this and potential uh, ways to work on this. So, yeah, thank you, Chris, Philip, and Eric for coordinating and joining today. Next week, we're actually going to have Darren Zhu from Adams.org presenting, and we might actually have one of the Decentralized Society paper authors join us for that call. So at least once a month, we're going to be bringing in outside projects to come in, discuss, present on what they're doing, and just have a discussion with the SCURF community. So uh, yeah, thank you all. Uh, I really appreciate you all joining, and always glad to have an excuse to, to see you again. Uh, and yeah, we will uh, speak soon. Let, us, let me know if there's any questions about 
uh, the community calls or anything else coming up. And otherwise, have a wonderful rest of your Thursday. Thank you so much, Thanks, Eugene, for organizing. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. -bye. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone.